Grace and peace be multiplied to each of you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. If you would get your Bible and turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Let me offer another prayer and then we'll hear the reading of God's word. Father, thank you indeed for the blessings of this day and for the rich time together in your word and in fellowship with one another around your word. In these closing moments of our time together, we pray afresh that you would be our teacher. Help us to lay aside all malice, deceit, envy, hypocrisy, and slander, so that as newborn infants we will crave the pure spiritual milk of your word and grow thereby, having tasted of your goodness. Help me to speak your word with faithfulness, clarity, authority, passion, wisdom, humility, and freedom. And may Christ be exalted as the word is explained, we pray for your glory. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. I want to talk about how the Lord grows his church. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Amen. As Mark mentioned, I served the church that I grew up in for almost 18 years, year 2008, the Lord called me to serve a congregation on the other side of the country in Jacksonville, Florida. I had never been, in a sense, the new guy. In my first church, I had grown up there. My father had served that church for some years. And so even though the role was new, I knew the congregation and they knew me. I, I didn't know anyone in Jacksonville. I was new to the congregation. This was a new position for me to be in. And I called a friend of mine to ask for advice about what to prioritize in this new work. He replied by telling me a parable. A parable about a group of bandits who schemed to rob a bank in a local town. However, the bank was well protected and they couldn't find a way to overtake it. And so one of the bandits came up with a great scheme. A few of these gangsters went to the outskirts of town and started setting barns on fire. Hearing the alarms, the residents of the city all rushed out to the outskirts of town to put out the fires in the barns, and while they were putting out the fires in the barns, the bandits robbed the bank. My friend wisely warned me, when you get to Jacksonville, whatever you do, guard the bank at all costs. This is the counsel I would offer you as we close our time together. Multiple, various, competing fire alarms scream for our attention in ministry. But you must keep the main thing the main thing. 
You must guard the bank, if you will. You must keep your priorities in order. Keep your priorities in order. You must properly understand what the Lord has called the church to be and do. We as pastors to be faithful must have both a high view of Christ and his church. You cannot have a high view of Christ and a low view of the church at the same time. You must understand the meaning and the message and the mission of the church as Christ has so ordained it. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 16 is one of the key passages in the New Testament about what the church is to be and do. It is a part of an extended passage, 1 through 16, that really is a call to unity. This call to unity is what begins the passage in verses 1 through 3. I therefore... A prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Verses four through six then go on to present to us the grounds of Christian unity, the basis of Christian unity. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. In Christ, we have been called to spiritual unity, but unity is not uniformity. There is diversity amidst that unity. Verses 7 through 10 go on to say, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. The exalted Christ has bestowed a diversity of gifts amongst the members of his body for the sake of that body working together in spiritual unity for the growth of the body. What are these gifts? What are the functions of these gifts? What, are, what is the purpose of these gifts? Verses 11 through 16 go on to answer those questions. This is a long and complex statement of Paul as is typical in the book of Ephesians. But the point here is really simple. He is trying to show us that the spiritual unity of the church is essential for the spiritual maturity of the church. And in so doing, in verses 11 through 16, we get a, a clear look of the role of the pastor, the role of the shepherd teacher. As a gifted person, God gives in Christ to the church to lead the church to spiritual maturity in Christ. Here we see how the Lord grows his church. We also see here what the church should look like as it grows up. Consider those two main ideas with me. The process by which the Lord grows his church and the purpose for which the Lord grows his church. First in verses 11 through 13, consider the process by which the Lord grows his church. The New Testament does not define the church as much as it describes the church. 
describes the church with various word pictures. The primary metaphor for the church in the New Testament is the one used here in this chapter, that of a, of a body. In fact, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 begins by saying, in terms of the grounds of unity, there is one body. Christ is the head of the church. The church is the body of Christ. Every believer is a member of the church, and every member has been given a function to facilitate the spiritual growth of the church in Christ. And here, Paul lays out for us how the Lord works through this process to grow the church to spiritual maturity. He first says the church grows through spiritual gifts. Verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Here, in this passage, we see that uh, in verse 8, Paul claims that the Lord Jesus Christ himself is the ultimate fulfillment of Psalm 68, verse 18. In verse 8, referring to it, he says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And going forward, it is this latter part that he will place his emphasis in. He gave gifts to men. And when you get to verse 11, we see that these gifts the Lord has given to the church is actually gifted people. He gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherd or pastor teachers. In 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans chapter 12, spiritual gifts are listed there that are given to enable the saints to serve. Here, these offices are presented as spiritual gifts given to the church to equip the saints to serve. The Lord has given gifted people to the church to equip the church. There are apostles, literally sent ones. In the strictest sense, this refers to those who are eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and commissioned by him to proclaim the gospel and establish the church. The term is also used in a broader sense for those sent by the church. But the term here is the stricter sense, the official sense of the term. These apostles are apostles of Jesus Christ. He has given a foundational ministry to proclaim the gospel and to established the church. Alongside of them are mentioned here the prophets. These were God's mouthpiece. More than just preachers, these prophets proclaimed the word of God by the revelation of God. And twice beyond this passage in Ephesians, these apostles and prophets are mentioned together. Go left to chapter 2, verse 20. And we see there that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Drop down to chapter 3, verse 5, where Paul speaks of the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Prophets and apostles had a foundational ministry in the church. And you only need to lay a foundation once. We don't need apostles and prophets. And a whole lot of other titles we are stuffing the church with these days. <laughs> Evangelists here are proclaimers of the good news. The Bible describes Philip as an evangelist in Acts chapter 21, verse 8. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, Paul bids Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. Here we are presented evangelists as gifts the Lord gives to the church. No doubt they share the good news with the lost, but it is key to note that they are listed here as gifts to the church. They function within the church. But then he mentions here the shepherds and teachers or the pastors and teachers and the grammar here presents one role, one office, that of the pastor teacher. Here, as has been mentioned in our time together, is different terminology for the same office. There are two New Testament offices, the, the elder, which interchangeably is described as elder, or overseer, or pastor. There is the office of the elder, and then the office of the deacon. Elders le serve by leading, deacons lead by serving. Here we see the ministry of the elder, the pastor teachers of the church. They are, as the text says here, shepherds. They are pastors. Shepherds lead and feed and care for and nurture and protect the flock. This is the role of the pastors, the elders of the church. We are to lead the flock and we are to feed the flock the word of God. We are to oversee the flock. We are to care for the flock and nurture the flock and protect the flock. I believe these various functions require a primary commitment to prayer and the ministry of the word. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 Verses 1 and 2, Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Well, that's a big setup, Paul. What is it that you are going to say next? He doesn't tell the Timothy then to lead the meetings and visit the sick and build buildings and organize programs. All of those things may have their place in the pastoral work, but the primary charge of the pastor is to preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And so the Lord grows his church by these spiritual gifts. You are, pastor, a gift to the church for its spiritual nurture, growth, and development. Consider also that Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 4 that the church grows through these spiritual gifts, but they grow by mutual service. It grows by mutual service. Why does God give the pastor teachers? Verse 12 says the Lord doesn't give pastors and teachers to do the work of the ministry. This is not how he says it. He says they are to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. The, the ministry of the pastor teacher is to equip the saints for the ministry. We have been rightly warned of the celebrity pastor who really refuses to serve among his people, but there is the other extreme that must be warned against as well. The, the pastor who, who is forced to do it all. There are a few celebrities, but, but most pastors serve under the radar without a spotlight on them and carry so many burdens and responsibilities. Here he says God has given the pastor's teacher a strategic role in the life of the church and in his purpose to build it up. But, but all of the burden of responsibility is not to be on the shepherd. He is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. To equip is to make fit, it's to make ready, it is to make prepared. Our job as pastors is to get the, the saints ready to serve. Here we are reminded of the priesthood of all believers. 
There, there, there is no biblical dichotomy of clergy and laity. Every member of the body is a minister of Jesus Christ. On the old ship of Zion, there are no passengers. Every party is a part of the crew. We are all called to serve. And the pastor's job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. There to be no spectators. You know, spectators usually end up being more than spectators. They're not just spectators, they're critics. We sit back and judge and measure those who are involved in the service and the work of the church. Here Paul says the, the pastor teachers are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. I like that broad terminology, whatever work ministry requires. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says, So then, as you have opportunity, do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I think that's a succinct two-word job description for the work of the ministry, do good. We are to shepherd the church so that the saints are equipped to do the work of the ministry for the building up, an architectural term, the edification, the erecting of, of the body of Christ. The burden of the pastor should be the edification of the church. We should be concerned that the saints entrusted in our care are, are being built up through mutual service as we equip the saints through the ministry of the word. Romans chapter 14, verse 19 says that we should pursue those things that relate to peace and mutual upbuilding. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26, Paul says, what's going on, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Let all things be done for mutual upbuilding, for edification. When we come together as a church, it's not about our gifts or our taste or our preference. It is about what will build up the body. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 rightly bids us to consider one another. While we're not together, we should be considering one another to find ways to stir one another up to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but exhorting one another and doing it all the more as we see the day approaching. The Lord grows the church. The church grows through spiritual gifts by mutual service, and it also grows toward perfect Christ-likeness. The shepherd teachers are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up of the body of Christ, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Go back up to verse one. We are called to walk worthy of the calling that we have received. The, the ultimate fulfillment of this calling will be in eternity, but, but we are to walk in it in the here and now. With an eye up toward, says verse 13, attaining the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Consider here that there is a call to unity. We are to attain the unity of the faith. 
There, there is a unity that is to be maintained, verse 3. We should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. But there is a unity that is to be attained, verse 13. The unity of the faith. The body of Christian truth. Jude 3 bids us to contend for the faith. Once and for all delivered to the saints. This is about more than agreeing with a creed or confession. This is doctrinal conviction rooted in personal devotion. Notice here how he ties the unity of the faith with the knowledge of the Son of God. Spiritual unity is essentially tied to spiritual devotion to Christ. It's a sense in which he's saying the, the, the closer we get to Christ, the closer we should be getting to one another. So there is a call to unity and then there's a call to maturity, a call to mature manhood. And again, we are reminded by this of the role of us as, as shepherds and teachers to be pointing the saints to, to maturity. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom that we may present everyone perfect or complete or mature in Christ Jesus. And a little more than a week from now, my oldest child, my son, my namesake will turn, God willing, 18 years old. And it's just an amazing thing to watch. I remember the night he was born. I was making what I thought my last trip before his birth, which was more than two months away. But when I landed in Atlanta from Los Angeles, later that evening as I sat down from preaching, I got the news that my wife had gone into surgery and my son was born. I caught the first flight home, rushed to the hospital to check on my wife and to see my my, my son. And he was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Not, not literally. <laughs> he was barely four pounds when he was born, it slipped down to three pounds, eight ounces, six ounces by the time I got home. We're concerned if he was going to make it. There were tubes and wires everywhere, but, but he was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen because he was mine. My son. Now, I, and I remember, if I may, I just, uh, forgive me, I... I remember when we got home and this, this little bitty, frail, little yellow baby. <laughs> and I said to Crystal, this boy better get some color on him fast or we're going <laughs> we to have an issue. <laughs> 18 years later, I love him because he's mine, but, but, but I, I also love him because he... He looks like me. And he wants to be with me. I get to serve him and he serves me. When I was a boy, my name is HB. There's, there's nothing behind it. Those initials are my name. My name. And they called me everything but HB when I was my son's age, so I wouldn't be embarrassed. But the moment my son found out that he had his daddy's name, he doesn't want to be called anything else. Friends, 
When sinners repent and run to the cross and trust the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ, Luke 15 says, heaven rejoices. One sinner that is made right with God. But how much can the heart of God be grieved if, if the church becomes this glorified nursery with ungrowing infants preoccupied with themselves? God continues to rejoice as he sees these born again babies in Christ growing to mature manhood. My son now drives me around. <laughs> he says here that there should be unity, there should be in Christ, maturity in Christ, and there should be conformity in, to Christ. We should attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Romans 8, 29 says, for whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be kind of firstborn among many brothers. We, that's the purpose of God in the, in among the saints and in our lives and in the church, to conform us to the image of his son. That we would reach the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. As incredible as that seems, it is the will of God to have the Spirit of God use the Word of God to make the children of God look like the Son of God. And He has called us as pastors and teachers for a strategic and sacred role in that process of growing the church. But if we may move on, consider then the purpose for which the Lord grows the church. Verses 11 through 13 tells us, if you will, how the Lord grows the church. And then verses 14 through 16 begins to describe what the church should be looking like as it matures. What should it look like? What, what should a grown-up church look like? And what uh, led me to land here, among other things, is, is the fact that here, this passage is totally devoid of so many things that we are tempted to be consumed by. Ch church growth here is not about how many people attend or how great the budget is, or how wonderful the facilities are, or how many programs you offer, or how large your quote-unquote platform is. It is about maturing to Christ's likeness. It's, it's all about Him. And here we see that a grown-up church is doctrinally sound, spiritually mature, and mutually equipped. Consider a doctrinally sound church. Shifting the negative language here, he says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Here, Paul says when the, when the church is not growing to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It is filled with believers who are, as he calls them here, children. Christians should be childlike. Christians should not be childish. And the, the growth of the church is hindered when we cater to self-centered babies in the church. 
We must strive to no longer be children. Notice how then Paul mixes metaphors here. And to to describe the instability of immaturity. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves. Tossed to and fro by the waves. This nautical metaphor here pictures a, a ship that is lost at sea. And and it is driven by by the storm-tossed waves. Our world is in a storm, friends. Our nation is in a storm. Our culture is in a storm. God forbid that we be as Jonah was, sleep in a storm. The church should not be adrift. As a ship without a rudder, without an anchor, without a compass. How do you know when a church is adrift at sea? Paul says it's carried about by every wind of doctrine. I'm a part of a church culture that if the if the preacher is doing it, the church is going to say amen and talk back to them. In fact, in my first pastorate, there was Sister Tibbs that would sit on the second row, and if I was was saying it right, she'd sit there and she'd rock and say, help help us, Lord. Lord, help us. And if if I was messing up, she'd say, help him, Lord. Help him. (laughs) Help him, Lord. (laughs) But, but, But here, Paul says, The the church needs to be mature enough to know what not to say amen to. In our opening time together, Mark, I think rightly challenged us that the, the, the church should hear other men open the word of God. But here we are reminded that the church needs to be mature enough to know who not to listen to. We need to know We need to be mature enough to know what blowing winds to stand against so that we're not immature children, unstable in our faith, and we're carried from from one extreme to the other. That, that, That term here, carried about, is used in Mark chapter 6, verse 55, to describe sick persons carried on their beds. This is what a church is like when it is not committed to the sound teaching of the Word of God. It is like little children in an unprotected nursery. It is like a rudderless ship in a stormy sea. It is like sick persons being carried to where they do not want to go. We're not to be as children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Notice the sinister motives here. Some men teach error because, frankly, they just don't know any better. It's important to sit down and learn before you stand up to teach. But but here are those who are not teaching out of ignorance. The, The church is under attack by men who in cunning and craftiness seeks to deceitfully lead the church away from the truth. We mentioned in 2 Timothy verses 1 and 2, it's charged to preach the word. But in verses 3 and 4, he begins to tell them why this charge and obedience to it is so important. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. I don't think this is people in the streets. 
This, this, these are professing believers who are walking in a false presumption of salvation and demonstrate that fact by their unwillingness to endure sound teaching. They won't put up with it. But he says, when they won't put up with it and leave your church, they don't go home. They go on a look for, for, for teachers having itching ears. They, they accumulate teachers who say what they want to hear. The Bible is filled with warnings against false teaching, but verses three and four here represent the other side of the coin. False teachers wouldn't have influence if professing believers didn't give them a platform. Marvin Vincent comments here succinctly that when the people want a calf to worship, a ministerial calf maker is readily available. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, this is always the challenging and convicting part for me. Verse 5 begins by saying, ask for you. Let the crowd do what the crowd is going to do, but ask for you. Let the world do what the world is going to do, but ask for you. Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And so we see then in verse 13, a doctrine, verse 14, a doctrinally sound church, but then in verse 15, we see a spiritually mature church. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. We're to grow up speaking the truth in love. This is an important reminder for those of us who preach and teach the word as shepherds. We must faithfully, as verse 14 warns, speak the truth, but we must speak the truth in love. From the beginning of my ministry, I, I believe I've been committed to 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. Begins, preach the word. As I'm growing older, and I hope that means as I've been growing more mature, I am also learning to prize not just the beginning of 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, but the end that says you're to do so with complete patience and teaching. We're not just to love the truth, we're to love those that he has called us to shepherd. But this is not just for the pulpit, this is for the pew as well. The teaching of God's word from the pulpit must be reinforced in the body life of the church as in Christian fellowship, we speak the truth to one another in love. Matthew, uh, Proverbs 27, verse six, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are profuse, wow. It's better to be hurt by a friend than kissed by an enemy. We're to speak the truth to one another, but we're to do so in, in love. Truth without love is brutality. Love without truth is hypocrisy. As saints, we are to speak the truth in love. And, and this is key for us to grow up. This is the heart, I think, of what Paul is saying here. This, the burden of the shepherd would, would be that our, our congregations would grow up. Grow up how? Grow up in every way. There should be no undeveloped or underdeveloped area of the life of the church, Paul is saying. We're to grow in the knowledge of Christ and grow in faith in Christ and grow in obedience to Christ and grow in service to Christ and grow in witness for Christ in every way. We're to grow up into him who is the head into Christ. Christ here is pictured as both the sphere and the standard of Christian maturity. We're to grow into him who is the head into Christ. 
Peter commands, 2 Peter 3, 18, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. In the knowledge, he is the sphere of growth, but he's also the standard. Philippians chapter 3 is, is very challenging where uh, it's the BD mentions Paul lays down his privilege that he may gain Christ, be found in Christ, that he might know Christ. This is a glowing testimony, but I like that he pumps the brake and, and admits him in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. This is a great testimony, but I haven't arrived yet. I haven't attained it yet. I have not yet attained, but, but this one thing I do, getting those things which are behind and reaching for what lies ahead, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I refer to that passage to remind us as shepherds, we are not the standard Christ is. My pastor recently retired after 42 years at the same church. I love him and thank God for him. I can't measure the investment he's made in my life and ministry and family, but it he, he chucks his faith and turns from Christ. I'm not going with him because he's not the standard. Christ is the standard. And the mature church in him is doctrinally sound, spiritually mature, and then finally, it is mutually equipped from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint. Verse 16, verse 15 says that Christ is the sphere and the standard of maturity, but, but now we also see he's the source of it. The whole body grows because of him and from him. But it also happens here as it is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. The joints and muscles hold the body together and equip it in strength. And the church is to be that way. We, we are to be held together by what every joint supplies so that when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let me note that in conclusion. That, that final phrase there is the third reference so far in this chapter to love. Having called us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have called, been called, verse 2 says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Verse 15 says we are to be speaking the truth in love. And now, verse 16 speaks of how the body builds itself up in love. In John 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, you are to love one another. And by this will all men know that you are my disciples as you have loved one for another. What does that look like in practical terms? Just drop down to the final verse of this chapter. I think maybe a good place to start. Verse 32, be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. My wife and I have a song. Many couples have a song. But we, we landed on a strange song. We fell in love with this song having heard my pastor lead his church in the singing of it. Every pastor needs a pastor. 
When we'd visit my pastor's church in the city there, he would often end the services by leading the congregation in the singing of this song. And I don't know, we were just bound together, and this song meant so much to us. We, we asked him to sing it at our wedding. The final service of my pastorate at the Los Angeles congregation, he was there, and he closed the service by leading us in that song. The song is written by John Fawcett. John Fawcett pastored the Waynesgate Baptist Church in northern England from 1765 to 1817, a long, fruitful pastorate with great influence in a small, impoverished church. Very early in his pastorate, when he was just 32 years old, he determined that he needed to go somewhere else. He needed a larger pulpit. His motivations were recorded in his diary. He wrote that over the years of ministry, my family has grown faster than my salary. He thought his prayers was answered when he was selected to succeed the great John Gill at the Carter's Lane Baptist Church. He announced his departure and prepared for the transition. And on his final day at the end of the service, he walked out of the service with his family and the grieving congregation followed them to the waiting wagon where their things were packed. And as they said their goodbyes, there was such weeping and grief and sorrow that his wife leaned over to Fawcett and said that I, I, I don't know how to leave. I'm not able to do it. He said, neither am I. And instead of pulling away, he had them to unpack the wagon, and he stayed there for the rest of his ministry until he died of a stroke. But he said he never made the equivalent of $200 in any year of his ministry. We don't know exactly all of his reasoning, but there is a strong hint at what made him stay. In the sermon that he preached the next Sunday after this life-changing decision, the following Sunday he preached from Luke 12, verse 15, where there, setting up the parable of the rich fool, Jesus says that a man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. At the end of the message, he read a poem that he had written to accompany the sermon. It was later set to music. Blessed be the ties that bind our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is likened to that above. I think the verse that gets me and my wife is that last verse, when we asunder part, it causes inward pain, but we will still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your son, our savior, the Lord of our lives, the head of the church, who has gifted and called out from among the saints, those of us who are shepherds, to serve the flock as representatives of Christ's purpose to lead his people to maturity in him. What an awesome task. What a sacred duty. What a wonderful privilege. We confess, Lord, that there are so many distractions that we are confronted with and we confess, Lord, our, our tendency to look away from the things that matter the most. Please have mercy on us. And help us all the more to set our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And teach us, Lord, to love the church 
the church that you are building and that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Help us not to be preoccupied with, with numbers and size and crowds and prominence, but may we faithfully proclaim your word in season and out of season, and may we lovingly shepherd your people to spiritual maturity in Christ so that his will, his purpose in and through the church would be fulfilled and that the church would be a sign and a herald and a foretaste of your present but not yet kingdom. As we leave here and go home to our places of assignment, be obviously present with us, actively in charge, and dynamically at work. For your glory we pray. Amen.